Our New Testament lesson today comes from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 13. I invite you to hear the word of the Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. Then they asked him, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah is indeed coming first to restore all things. How then is it written about the Son of Man, that he is to go through many sufferings and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written about him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. But God, on this day, in this place, through this media, we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, because you, O oh God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this morning we begin the second half of the Gospel of Mark, in which he pushes us to understand and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Ultimately, this has significance for you and me because we are lost without it. I mean, this seems like a perfect time to review that message. As you're viewing or you're reading this sermon, keeping social distance and self-quarantine with a manuscript or in front of a screen, you have realized that the question, where is our hope, is not hypothetical or academic. I think many of us have been surprised and not a little disheartened by the mass panic and the rush on the grocery stores. People are coming up with all sorts of ways to try and console themselves. Just the other day, there was a video posted on Instagram and then promoted on Yahoo with celebrities singing John Lennon's Imagine. Look. I don't want to be that guy, but the choice of song illustrates the complete misapprehension of the situation. There is no hope in human imagination. Listen to the words that are offered as an encouragement. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. If we dream, if we try, we can solve the world's problems and fix the brokenness around us? Live for today? Are you kidding me? That's the answer? Really? How has that worked so far? I mean, it's a pretty melody. 
But the message is completely off. Though this crisis is temporary, and it is only temporary, the stripping away of all of our security blankets and idols has made clear this truth. We are dependent upon God for our life, now, and for eternity. We're delusional if we think that dreamers and hard work will resolve things and make them perfect. We are lost without God. Period. Hard stop. Now, in the event that this virus really is the end, using hyperbole to make this point, the most prolific hoarders could last weeks, maybe months. Friends, that's not hope. That's hell. If the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, and it is, then we need to begin articulating the hope that's found within us. Now, in the midst, the message of the gospel is good news. It was good news when Jesus was proclaiming it in the circumstances of his day. It is good news now in our circumstances. It will be good news going forward no matter what the circumstances. We have hope, real hope. That's what our scripture text covers today. Six days after Peter's confession that you are the Messiah, Jesus took a few of his disciples up to the mountaintop. Now, it's worth noting that Jesus didn't take all 12 up on the mountain. He invited three specific people. And it's really not difficult to imagine the other nine, hey, hey, wait a minute, that's not fair, how come they get to go? God does not choose everyone, every time, for everything. Let me say that again. God does not choose everyone, every time, for everything. And that's okay. Why? Because God is God, and we are not. We don't get to make claims against God for what's owed or what we think is fair. And I'm going to let you think about that for a few minutes before we get back to it. The scene here in Mark is reminiscent of the Old Testament passage that we read earlier. Moses was instructed to go up on the mountaintop to meet with God. He was instructed to bring specific people, though some were only allowed part of the way up. Moses went up, and then he waited for six days, and then was called from the descending cloud in the seventh. And scripture says, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. That means back down on the plain below the mountains, it looked like a volcano or some sort of wildfire was enveloping the area where Moses was supposed to be. It was pretty frightening for the people. But mountaintops are fascinating Fascinating thoughts in our mind. I mean, we describe powerful, transformative moments, a retreat, a communion experience, a championship, as a mountaintop experience. The mountaintop experience is one that we want. In fact, many people say they need the experience of God in order to be convinced and convicted. And some mountaintops are wonderful and are moving. But scripture teaches us that mountaintop experiences also are frightening. They're terrible. They're overwhelming. We call them come to Jesus moments for a reason. It absolutely strips away any pretense of self-sufficiency, of pride, of accomplishment, of ego. When we encounter the living God in time, in person, for real, we become acutely aware of how blind we can get in our day-to-day -day lives. 
And when it happens, we don't always respond in the most appropriate or competent way. It's no different with Peter, James, and John. And in my imagination, Peter kind of looks like Mark Cuban, the, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks and one of the characters on Shark Tank. In my mind's eye, Peter was big, muscular. He, was, he could be intimidating. He had been a successful businessman, but he tended to have a temper, and he tended to be a bit blustery and ornery, and he tended to speak first and listen later. Well, the three boys along with Jesus at the Transfiguration were terrified, but not speechless. And Peter started talking about building booths. Now, what follows clearly illustrated that Peter didn't know what he was talking about, but he wasn't simply babbling gibberish. His suggestion was likely based on one of the major festivals uh, and celebrations, the Festival of Booths. Peter may have thought that Moses and Elijah were going to engage in a conversation with Jesus for an extended period, like a week, for example, and that they were going to update the practice of the festival. I mean, we don't know for sure, but that may have been Peter's train of thought. And if we take a moment to remember that the Gospel of Mark is based largely upon Peter's teaching and reflections, you can almost see him pulling Mark aside and saying, you know, we could probably leave my response out of this story. But here's the point. Mountaintop experiences happen because God creates them. Much as we want, much as we pray, much as we wish, it is God who creates them. He chooses. And frustrating as it may be for us, Scripture's description of mountaintop experiences demonstrates that God is God and we are not. We cannot simply march up the mountain and demand things from Him. He commands those who are to come to come. That's how it works. So, there they were, Peter, James, and John, minding their own business with Jesus, when all of a sudden, they found themselves in this overwhelming, brilliant whiteness, watching Jesus have a conversation with Moses and Elijah. Now, among the things that are really odd, and there are many, they apparently had no difficulty recognizing and identifying Moses and Elijah. Now think about this for a minute. Moses and Elijah appear talking and living thousands of years after their time. Scripture records Moses' death. Elijah was taken up to heaven in a chariot, but he had purely, pretty clearly been absent uh, for centuries before this time. Yet there they were, alive and talking with Jesus. Now, on the way back down, Jesus told the disciples not to say anything about this until after the Son of Man is risen. And they were talking with one another about what Jesus meant by risen from the dead. Now, they must have been puzzling about it because they asked about why the scribes said that Elijah must come first. I mean, having just seen Elijah alive, they were trying to put together the pieces. Now, as a side, I'm, I'm not going to spend time on the prophecy here and Jesus' response that it had been fulfilled. I mean, it's a great topic for another sermon or a Bible study. And, I mean, i got to be honest, I thought, what else are you guys going to be doing today? I could go long. But I want to press on, and I want to... With, with the more important message for where we are right now. The transfiguration conversation and Jesus' statement about rising from the dead should be a great encouragement for us. Death does not have the final word, and God is the God of the living, not the dead. Moses and Elijah were recognizable. 
they must have had some sort of body, some sort of features that made their identities obvious to Peter, James, and John. I mean, these two Old Testament legends talked with Jesus. We don't know what they talked about, nor do we have any quotes from that conversation, but we know they communicated. And you may be saying to yourself, well, yeah, that's great, that's fine, that's well, and it's weird. But what does that mean for me? It means this. It means that Jesus believed and lived in the knowledge of the resurrection. Jesus' frame of reference was eternity and the eternal kingdom of God. It was what he was proclaiming. He knew God's kingdom was coming into fulfillment, even with all of the earthly evidence around him saying something completely different. There on the mountaintop, the voice said, This is my beloved son. Well, as it had been at the time of the baptism, the voice confirmed his identity. So that much wasn't new. But look at what took place next. Listen to him. Listen to him. This was not a suggestion. It was a command. It was an imperative. It was a direct instruction. Listen to him. The living, resurrected Jesus still speaks today by the Holy Spirit. I mean, at baptism, the Spirit descended like a dove. At Pentecost, Spirit came like tongues of fire. And today, the Spirit still speaks. But do we have ears to hear? If so, we need to remind ourselves of the voice on the mountaintop. Listen to him. Listen to him. What is the Spirit of the living, risen Jesus Christ saying? Well, this is a question that has some very practical applications. First, it means pay attention to what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus came teaching the reality and the presence of the kingdom of God. He meant it. It wasn't just a teaser message to draw big crowds. I mean, the message wasn't filler between miracles. The miracles were demonstrations of the truth of the message. They were validations of the power of God. They were fulfillments of the promises of the prophets. They were attention grabbers not in terms of entertainment, but rather as expressions of wake up, look, see, listen, hear. Now remember, this transfiguration took place soon after Peter's confession when the disciples finally, finally gave the answer to the question they had been asking all along. Who is this? You are the Messiah. The lifting of the veil and the revealing of Jesus' true identity had some profound implications. The implications of his being the Messiah were just as Jesus told them when Peter made his confession. The Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again target wasn't to overthrow Rome. Rome was too small. The target to be destroyed is death. And he was going to accomplish that victory by going through death. Now you may have heard this before. You may have even heard it thousands of times before. However, as we are in the midst of of a worldwide panic over a disease that has shown our frailty and our inability to be in control. In short, a vivid illustration of the world being imprisoned by the fear of death. The transfiguration followed by the command, 
listen to him is so much more profound. As believers, we don't need to fear death. Death has no power over us. The coronavirus may be able to kill our body, but it doesn't have any authority over our soul. It has no power to judge. It is not a standard or a litmus test of righteousness. We need not fear death because we know the one who has defeated death, the one who has given us his victory, and the one who loves us. And we know that because we listen to him. Well, second, Listen to him means obey what he commands. On the way back down the mountain, Jesus commanded the other three not to say anything until the Son of Man had risen from the dead, and they obeyed. Now Mark wrote that they discussed among themselves what he meant by risen from the dead, but they obeyed his command not to talk about the transfiguration, even though they didn't understand fully what he was saying. Now, obeying commands and obeying what Jesus commands is not something we like to hear or do. We like to hear the parts we like, you know, love, grace for us, mercy, etc. But when it comes down to doing what Jesus commanded, we have our reservations. You know, it may cost too much. Too much time, too much of our energy, it's too risky for our reputation and how other people see us. Too much time spent with people we'd rather avoid than engage. But listen to him is not just conformity to Christ's commands when things please us. It also is conformity to Christ's command when things are not pleasing to us. Now, obeying what Jesus commanded looks a lot like what we've already read in the Gospel of Mark. In chapter 6, Jesus sent out the disciples in pairs to teach and proclaim his message of the kingdom of God, encouraging people to repent. In other words, the disciples were sent out to exhort people to give up on the things they cannot save, to repent and to turn to the one who can save. Again, the demonstration of power the disciples, that the disciples were authorized to perform, that is, casting out unclean spirits and curing people, it was designed to validate the message. Well, what does this mean for us? I mean, should we storm the hospitals this week, casting out unclean spirit and anointing people with oil to cure diseases? Now, I have not heard that call. What I have heard can be summed up in a nutshell. Pray. Prayer is the work of faith. It means taking time to come before God and lift up specific cares and concerns. And it is more than just a mental monologue of a wish list. It's a conversation. That means listening, too. It means sitting uncomfortably in silence, attending God, and listening for his word. Because you got to know, God is not bullied by a barrage of words, nor is he really waiting for us to tell him what to do. God wants you to spend time with him. Right now, what do you have in abundance? Time. Obey and spend time in conversation with God. The third thing, listen to him means follow where he leads. Where was Jesus going? Well, remember earlier that I said we don't get to make claims against God for what we are owed or for what we think is fair? Let me go back to that for a moment. Jesus, who's greater than Moses and Elijah, Jesus, 
who commanded Peter, James, and John to go with him, Jesus, whose garment was brilliant white and brighter than any white possible on earth, this same Jesus is now on the road to pay the penalty for our sin. He's walking the walk to do the work of the Son of God. And that really is the second half of the Gospel of Mark. One of the earliest hymns or songs in the church is found in Philippians 2. It reads, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not account equality with God as something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus made no demands for what is owed or what was fair. Instead, he pursued the path that led him to the table that he prepared, the table in which he declared the new covenant, the new covenant for which his body was broken, and his blood was shed. And those aren't empty phrases. His body was broken. His blood was shed. So where is Jesus going? Friends, here's the good news we have. The same Jesus who is headed to the cross was raised from the dead. He ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And that's for real. That's not just because we've memorized the Apostles' Creed, but it's because it happened, and that is where he is now. That's where we're going if we listen to him. Because if we listen to him, we will follow where he leads. Remember that Jesus conversed with Moses and Elijah. There's a resurrection. We have the hope of reconciliation with God because of Jesus. We have the promise of eternal life in the resurrection because of Jesus. This is the good news that we have to share. It's the basis of our faith. It is the foundation of our life. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then, suddenly, the clouds cleared and the dazzling disappeared. They looked around and they saw only Jesus. That's the visual to remember this morning. Friends, in life, there are clouds. There are things that dazzle. There are crises that captivate our attention. Things seem so big, yet they're all temporary. The mountaintop, the mundane, the good, the bad, all of these things are temporary. They will all clear and disappear. And when we look around, all we will see is only Jesus. This Jesus, this Jesus born of Mary, this Jesus who healed the sick, calmed the wind and sea, was victorious over evil and raised the dead, this same Jesus about whom the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. This same Jesus is the Jesus who stands before us now and says, Come, come to me. Lean on these everlasting arms. Friends, what good news we have to share. Jesus saves. And suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus.
So friends, as you go forward with your day today, I just want you to remember the voice from the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. When all else clears, it's only Jesus. Well, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest, remain, and abide with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.